Okay, so I'm going to lecture from my little tea house. Um, this is Renaissance and Reformation. Um, we're about at the year 1500, 1490s, and I thought I would insert here a um, lecture online for obvious reasons about exploration. And I'm going to give you the bigger picture. <clears throat> I actually have no idea how long this will go. I'm going to do it completely off the top of my head. But one thing I want to do before we start is please get yourself a map. Either put on another computer with a world map on it, get a physical map, do something on your phone maybe, um, because I'm going to be talking about a lot of places and I think unless you can envision them geographically, you'll be at a great disadvantage. And obviously I don't have a big map to show as I do in, in the classroom, uh, which would be ideal. So if you need to, just stop the video at any point and just look at a map and I'll say when you should do that, okay? So to start with, <clears throat> let's, um, let's talk in general about the things that historians generally account to be the most important in uh, designating the early modern period as opposed to the Middle Ages or Renaissance in between. And we talked about a few things already. Um, obviously the birth of the modern nation state, which we'll talk about in greater detail and uh, maybe even political realism with Machiavelli. We'll talk about the Reformation obviously being very important, and we'll talk about demographic, social, and um, economic change that is very, very important in the 16th century as we'll see population rises. But I think the most obvious thing that really delineates uh, the early modern period, separates it from the Middle Ages, is, um, is trade. And I'm not going to use the word exploration because that's not really where it begins. That's not why it's done. Uh, Columbus was not an explorer. He was a merchant, right? He was trying to get to China. And I think once you kind of put that in perspective, once you understand that China is the real goal, the spices, the silk, the porcelain, the jewels, the incense, the luxury goods that were coming from the East in general, even if not from China specifically, that's what people really wanted, and that's what, of course, Columbus was trying to get, and, and what spurred it was not um, Columbus's idea, <laughs> to obviously, to find, he wasn't trying to find a new world or anything like that, but it was, um, it was increasing or making more efficient or getting better at the trade with Asia that was the real stimulus for all this. So let's start painting this picture just with a general account of late medieval trade, because I think that will kind of explain why this is such a revolution and why it's so so very different um, afterwards. So trade was not entirely local in the late Middle Ages. We know that there was a lot of trade, say for example the wine trade that went from Bordeaux carrying fine wine to England uh, from the Norman period, you know, was uh, pretty extensive. The Hanseatic League had an extensive network of uh, merchant cities that extended from northern Germany all the way up through uh, Scandinavia into um, Reval, which is Tallinn in modern-day Estonia. Look at a map of the Baltic right now. And as far as, as uh, what's now St. Petersburg's uh, into Finland. So, And what they were doing was sending manufactured goods, by and large, to Scandinavia. And they were getting furs and timber and pitch, which of course you used to seal the outside of ships. And, um, and that was a very lucrative trade. Eventually they're sending beer one way and things, things like that. Um, those were done in fairly small ships. And the one thing that I, I should emphasize is that the Baltic is very shallow. It's like a few hundred feet deep. You don't really need something that's ocean worthy. Um, they had ships that could go at least, at least slightly out from the coast, but the way that they navigated was that they would look at two different points on the coastline and triangulate. You know where you are, you look at one point on the coast, you look at another point, and then you can calculate your distance um, using this triangulation, very simple mathematics really, and then figure out how far you've gone and, um, you know, navigation is by and large. You keep sight of land, okay? And that's very easy to do in the Baltic by and large. It's easy to do if you're going up the coast of France to England. It's very easy in the Mediterranean. You know, there's, there's not a, there are not many places where you're going to completely, utterly lose sight of land. Um, so, so navigation tends to be simple. Trades tends to be, um, even if it's long-term, it's, um, 
it's not in luxury goods. It's, it's in basic staples. And if you think about also the trade within Europe itself, it's by and large um, cities are positioned along rivers. So it's river traffic. It's up and down the Rhine, the Rhone in France, the um, Dnieper and Dniester in Russia. The, you know, um, you know it's, not, it's not a the Danube <laughs> going to Vienna. So cities by mostly are on, on rivers and that river traffic is by small shallow ship, by barge even sometimes. So no one is traveling really far. No one is doing anything terribly different than anyone else in terms of navigational techniques or shipbuilding techniques. And in fact, the place where we should return to in our longer conversation is Venice because Venice is, has some innovations which I think will be very crucial one is that the Venetians, remember they're using galleys. A galley is nothing really complicated. It goes back to ancient times. Very long, narrow ship that has oar men in the middle and someone is going stroke, stroke, stroke. And they're basically rowing their way around, which means you don't have to worry about the currents or anything. And the, um, if there's wind, you can put up a sail and move more quickly, but, but the point is that you really need to have food for those oarsmen. That's the fuel, right? It's like you know, filling up your your um, tanker, you know, your ship with 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 gasoline. You need to feed those oarsmen, which means you need to stop fairly often for water. And there's not a big hold in a ship like that. Um, the galleys that I've seen are maybe, gosh, they're pretty long. They can be like 50. 70 feet long, but they're not much wider than this room. So you put two or three people on either side. It's a, it's a very long, narrow boat, and um, there's not a big hold. So there's not a whole lot you can actually fit into the ship at once, meaning that, um, you know, in ancient times it was amphorae, it'll be wine casks later um, through the Mediterranean. But, but the Venetians, the thing that they, they capitalize on is that they open up trade to the east better than anyone else. Their only real competitor is Genoa, but Genoa's trade is really mostly in the other side of the Mediterranean. Venice gets this interesting connection to um, the eastern Mediterranean ports, primarily because of a deal they cut in one of the Crusades in which they traded transport to the east in return for the Crusaders taking Zara back from uh, Muslims, I think, or the Hungarians, maybe, um, and uh, Muslim troops, I think. And <clears throat> they um, made this trade and they built a, a nice big fleet and basically carried these Crusaders back and forth. And they had trade connections, even when politically the rest of Europe was, <laughs> was sometimes even at war with, with uh, the Ottoman Empire, the, the Venetians maintained that trade connection. Um, they were independent. Remember, they could do what they wanted. And the gal what they built in the course of the latter Middle Ages was a kind of mercantile empire in which they controlled the coastline, built these little little port mercantile hubs. They didn't rule the, the places they stopped. They just made these little mercantile hubs where they would take their galleys, plant them there, pick up supplies and water, food and water, and then continue down the coast. So if you look at a map of what was then the Dalmatian coast, it was the former Yugoslavia. So we're talking about, you know, Croatia and um, Herzegovina and Montenegro and all the way down the coast of Greece. Um, they took Corfu, for example. They took Crete. They took Cyprus. In fact, a Venetian family, the Lusignans, ruled Cyprus um, after the Crusades. So these were all places that they could stop off on the way to Beirut, on the way to Alexandria, on the way to various eastern ports where they picked up the goods. So they're, 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 they have to go through middlemen, right? But they are the almost, they don't have a monopoly in any real sense, but they, they can kind of control the goods that are going from the eastern ports to Venice. And remember the Venetian state supported, they had a kind of mercantile marine. They, um, they armed, they had armed uh, ships to guard all this. They built an arsenal so they could build ships themselves. So remember, this is one of the advantages of being a city-state is you can have policies which are in your own best self-interest as a state. And the mercantile oligarchy in Venice, obviously, they're going to be into building ships and protecting them with guns. So they did it. So um, the other crucial factor, 
state support these uh, little um, ports where they pick up goods, uh, supplies, food, and water, having connections to the East, um, is that the stuff that they were carrying is all luxury items that are very small. So they're spices, as I said, silk, porcelain, sometimes, anything that comes from the East. Um, spices, I think, are the most important, and I think that way, of course, food historian. Um, let's talk about these spices for a second, where they're coming from. So we're talking about cinnamon, very important in late medieval cuisine and medicine, that comes from what's now um, Sri Lanka, then Ceylon. We're talking about pepper, which comes from the Malabar coast of India. We're talking about uh, cloves, which come from Ternate and Tidore, which is in the Moluccas in, in modern-day Indonesia. We're talking about nutmeg, which comes from the island of Banda, also really, really, really far out. Um, cassia from Vietnam, ginger from China, um, long pepper from Java, uh, cubebs. I mean, there's a lot of very, very interesting spices that come from Asia in general, okay? And the um, way that they get to Europe is that Arab, well, actually, Asian merchants collect them to start with. They pass them on to Arab merchant middlemen in places like Malacca. And Mal Malacca is not to be confused with Molucca. That's, that's Indonesia. Malacca is near Singapore, modern-day Singapore. It's on that little Malay Peninsula that hangs down. Look at your map, okay? And they're picked up there by Arab middlemen who will take these in ships that are called Dao, D-H-O-W, which is a long, narrow, thin ship made like out of reeds. It's really very simple. They pack this stuff in, they hug the whole coast, and I want you to imagine going from um, Indonesia around, all the way up around the coast of India, all the way around India, all the way up through to the Middle East, where they'll go up the Red Sea, or up the, um, into the Mediterranean overland, right? Because there's, there's no Suez Canal. They, can, they have to take this stuff overland. And they will, from there, deposit the goods in the markets in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and that's where the Venetians pick it up. So you can imagine that these things are extraordinarily expensive by the time they get to London, or the time they get to Iceland, because that's how far some of these spices went. If the, cookbooks of that era, at least are to be believed. And they um, are markers of wealth and status, right? If you can afford spices on your food, you'll use it liberally. You're going to sprinkle all, all over your food to show that you're wealthy. And they're also used in medicine because they're considered hot and drying. So if you have a cold or coughs or fever or whatever, these are going to be, not fever, sorry. Um, they're hot and dry and spicy. You put it on your tongue, right? The, pepper burns a little bit, and so does ginger, is that they're considered medicinal for that reason. Against cold and moist, phlegmatic um, illnesses, you're going to use hot and dry things as a corrective, okay? That makes perfect sense in, in medicine. <clears throat> so the um, spices, the spice market is pretty buoyant in back in Europe. And what makes it even more so is think of that economic situation after the plague that we discussed when ordinary people have buying power, they're imitating those people above them, they're suddenly thinking, oh, I could afford some spices, I think this will be great, I'm gonna you know, imitate the, the, mer you know, the head merchant of my town or my mayor or whatever it may be, and they will um, use these spices as, again, markers of status, and that, so that increases in the late Middle Age, or in the Renaissance, right? After 1348 and nine, um, latter 14th century, just like people are eating more meat and drinking more and putting more household objects, you know, buying more, th putting in more fireplaces, they're consuming more spices in general. Okay, it was, it's, it's there earlier in the Middle Ages. It's just much, much rarer. Uh, people used to pay rents and pepper, and now it's almost anyone can afford a little bit of pepper. So the Venetians become ridiculously wealthy on this, as can be expected. They have not a complete but almost monopoly on that spice trade, supplying the rest of Europe, okay? And that model is kind of unique, the, the idea of having the galleys, the, the ports, the state funding to, to, to protect it. Remember, there's still pirates in the Mediterranean. Um, 
And then one country, and here's where our story really begins, not what you'd expect, looks and sees what the Venetians are doing. We're talking about Portugal. Kind of backwater, really. I mean, politically, economically, militarily. Um, but it's there, and it, it, it you know, survived in the, the, the Reconquista. They rebuilt a state. It was a, um, a daughter of, of the Spanish king, but wedding present, kind of, okay, take Portugal as a kingdom. But it, but it was a, a real country. And in the 15th century, um, they had a king, Enrique. Let's call him Henry. That's what he's usually called in uh, English. Henry the Navigator. Although I've read many places that he never actually went to sea, but he gets the title The Navigator because of his sponsorship of um, navigation and actually founding a school sort of where you'd go to learn to, to navigate. Now, why, why Portugal? Why <laughs> this little place out of nowhere? So um, take a look at your map. Portugal faces the Atlantic. They um, are not going to have the same kind of easy navigating from around the coast of France to England, through the Baltic, around the Mediterranean, their interests are going to be toward Africa. And the reason for this is partly, uh, it's partly dynastic. I mean, it has to do with the fact that the Moors ruled Portugal and Spain, and then they took that back, and the Portuguese actually had interest in conquering Northern Africa to start with. But where they're, they really kind of figured out, <laughs> more importantly, than, um, than conquest was following the Venetian model. Let's just set up a little trading port, a feitoria, that's why you call it in Portuguese. It means, it's kind of cognate with the word factory, but it's, it's trading post. And let's get the stuff they have in Africa and bring it back to Portugal. And let's trade them with the stuff they want, that we have. We have horses, we have guns. They need that, they want that stuff badly. Um, what do we want that they have? Gold, number one. Um, but we want ivory, which was carved into these beautiful, you know, uh, devotional pieces and personal items. Ivory is lovely. It, or, elephants, obviously. Um, they have uh, some spices. They have melagueta pepper, which is a very cold grains of paradise. Does it get more exciting than that? They use this um, in medieval cooking, just like pepper. And it's, it's more interesting than pepper, actually, I think. Uh, they also have slaves, and the slave trade isn't really big, but, you know, if you're a wealthy family, you might buy a little African boy and keep him in your household to serve guests, and people like doing that, okay? It's not plantation economy, it's not anything like that. But the Portuguese do start to come, in their, in their travel toward the south, around the coast of Africa, they begin to take a couple of um, um, small island complexes. Madeira is one of them. Uh, the uh, Spanish get the Canary Islands about the same time, 15th century. Um, so, so they're getting these islands um, in which the native population, either there is no native population or, they're, or they, kill them, they're, they die off from disease. The, the guanches on the, in the Canaries is the perfect example of that. And I want you to keep that in mind for a moment because this idea of moving into an island, suddenly having all the local population die, from conquest or disease or whatever, and then saying, okay, we came here to make money, what are we gonna do? That's where slaves fit in, okay? It's moving the Africans, moving slaves into those places for, for what they don't even quite know yet. And let me just briefly stop here for a moment because the part that they don't quite know yet is actually sugar. And sugar is, we should consider it in the Middle Ages as one of the spices. It's imported from India. They try to grow it in Sicily and you know, southern European ports, it really doesn't work very well there. It's not quite tropical and hot enough. These little islands off the coast of Africa are perfect, right? Um, so just keep that in mind. There's a model for what to do with slaves, what to grow there, how do we deal with this that will be very important when we get to the New World. But in any case, they, the Portuguese also have an advantage in that going into the Atlantic, they need to figure out a way to deal with ocean <laughs> waves and currents, and most importantly, the patterns of the winds. This is something that you will not see on a modern map at all, but actually the way the currents flow is essential to when you can go somewhere and when you can't, and which direction you can go. It's essential, of course, in the Indian Ocean too, but Europeans didn't quite know that yet. So what happens, 
is if you look at the coast of, Af of um, Af Northern Africa, above the equator, the currents move in a way, and I'm moving backwards, obviously, because I'm thinking the map this way, but they move clockwise, okay? So you can go down the coast of Africa very easily. If you try to go to the, below the equator, the currents go the other way. They go counterclockwise, so they're <laughs> counterclockwise, so they're going to prevent you from looking at the coast and seeing your point of for triangulation and navigating down. So it's so it becomes very very difficult once you round that that uh, the Ivory Coast and the Gold Coast and you go below the equator. So they develop um, ships that are more sea worthy. What what is called the now now N A tittle O. Sort of pronounced like nano, but now, um, and um, it's a higher ship. It has a much bigger uh, space underneath the the, the berth. The, the keel is much longer, and it has masts with square rigging, so that it can actually go out into the ocean and go very fast. It's not something you can row. It's a bigger ship, and and it's usually measured by tonnage. What what I mean by tonnage is not tons like weight ton. Ton is um, is a barrel. <laughs> so how many barrels can you fit into the hold of this ship? Um, so if you can imagine one barrel, two barrel, three barrel in the space that I'm sitting right now, I could probably fit 15 barrels, maybe 20 barrels in, in this little tea house. Um, a ship of that era would be 50 is a small sh ship. Uh, 70 is about, about the size that they're, they're going in. So it's only two and a half, three times the size of the room I'm sitting in. It's very small, okay? These are not big ships, but the fact that they have a tub shape, basically, not like a cog, which is small. The cog is the one that the Hanseatic League took into the um, Baltic. This is deeper and lower and has more space underneath you have to actually put ballast in, in it to keep it upright, meaning you have rocks or whatever. Um, but the um, but it can go out into the ocean. Now, once you've gone out into the ocean, then you have to worry, okay, how do I navigate if I can't see the coast? Well, you have to use celestial navigation, which means you look at the North Star, and I want you to picture a um, astrolabe, big round circle with a sight on it, and a string that hangs down, and you look through the site, and you go, okay, 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 and bing, there's the North Star. North Star in the Northern Hemisphere is always visible and in the same place. The world turns around, the North Star is right there, pretty much. And then the string hangs down, and that will tell you your latitude. You want to remember latitude? Remember the word flat. Latitude is flat, okay? Longitude is long. So the weird thing is they can tell where they are north-south on the Earth because of the latitude, the flat line. You can tell whether you're at 35 degrees latitude, 34, when you hit the equator, when you're in the tropics, whatever. You can tell north-south. No idea <laughs> east-west. Longitude isn't invented, figured out until the 18th century with stable clocks you can bring on ships. A guy named George Harrison, he had a great gig with the Beatles, but you understand what I'm saying, okay? So, if you're traveling, you want to pick a latitude and stick to that, because otherwise you're going to get lost if you go out to sea. But if you have your astrolabe, you can see the North Star. You can figure out where you are on the Earth this way. It becomes more difficult when you get to the Southern Hemisphere, because you get too far around the bottom of the Earth, you can't see the North Star anymore. So that's a little more difficult. But the bigger challenge for them, they've got the navigation, they have... Um, cartographic skills, portal end charts were def uh, you know perfected by the Italians and the Portuguese. Um, they're, they're, if you ever look at an old map and you look at these rum lines that have all these little lines from a star, that's a way to figure out also where, where you're going and navigation. So they have a whole sophisticated set of tools for navigating better ships, bigger holds, more goods, less people on board that you have to feed, right? So the whole idea is that they want to get to the southern part of Africa. Now why, the question. Imagine if you could get around Africa and go all the way to India. What would happen is you could cut out the Venetians and the Arab middlemen 
and everyone get the spices directly, bring them right back to Europe. But the problem is they have to go to the equator, follow that current all the way out towards South America. Look at the map again. Towards sort of Brazil, really. I mean, that's really why they bump into Brazil. Um, Pedro Carbal in 1505 or something bumps into Brazil. Is that Africa and Brazil are fairly close. Is you have to follow that current all the way out and then swing back down to the very tip of Southern Africa. And they do this, um, this is done by uh, Bartolomeu Diaz, D-I-A-S, in um, 1480, I think it's 1481, something, some, somewhere around there. And they suddenly say, okay, we finally know where the bottom of Africa is. They didn't at all before this. And there's the Indian Ocean. We can follow those latitudes back, go across, bump into the Malabar coast, pick up those that pepper, go to Sri Lanka, pick up the cinnamon, go to Malacca, pick up the um, nutmeg, cloves, long pepper, all this cool stuff, and bring it back to Europe and make a fortune and cut out those middlemen entirely, knock out the Venetians. And in fact, that's actually what happens to Venice. <laughs> in the long run, the Venetians are... Uh, it takes a century, but they lose their monopoly and trade entirely. So, so in, in the make the long story short, what happens is the Portuguese do eventually land in India. In um, they found a colony in Goa, which is there right up into the after World War II. It's still a Portuguese colony. Um, that's uh, Alfonso Albuquerque, I think. Yeah, um, it's um, oh, the Lusiadas. Is this wonderful? epic by the poet Camoinch, and who am I thinking of? The guy who, who basically, they don't conquer India, this is the point. They just, they just land there, they set up uh, colonies, um, they have trading posts, exactly like the Venetian model, right? They go there, they pick up the goods, they trade, they come back, and the, and the governments protect them because it's just money, you know, coming in. I don't know who the hell's making that noise. So, um, I'll remember the person. Uh, it's not Magellan. It's not... Uh, anyway, the Portuguese get there, okay, to India. And they eventually take Malacca as their own port. They set up posts in what's now Indonesia, in Java. In uh, They go directly to Ternate and Tidore. And they go further than... They, they get Asia, you know, pretty much. Um, they found Macau in uh, China, which is a port up in uh, Portuguese port until 1999. I mean, right, right across the water from, from uh, uh, Hong Kong. And in fact, the remains of the cathedral, this Portuguese cathedral, are still there overlooking Macau. It's just this beautiful Baroque <laughs> kind of structure with these Chinese symbols on it. It's so strange and unusual. The, the shell of it is still there and that market underneath. Macau. And from Macau, of course, they go to China. Uh, from China, sorry, they go to Japan um, in the latter 16th century and set up trading posts there. They don't make themselves very welcome there in the long run, partly because they bring Jesuits with them and try to convert the Japanese. And the, the um, Japanese themselves are going through political turmoil and the um, uh, shogun says, finally, get rid of the, the Portuguese and the Jesuits and let's bring in people who are have no interest in converting us, and they invite the Dutch, oddly enough, in the 17th century. The, they confine them to a little island of Deshima outside of uh, Nagasaki, but, um, and the Dutch th remain there as a trading port up until the night through the 19th century, but they're not allowed on land. And, they, they're just, and there's no connection. And this is why Japan really closes off for hundreds of years, and in the whole Edo period, when it has almost no outside contact whatsoever, it's because of what the Portuguese did. But in any case, let's get back to the Portuguese. <clears throat> what does it do for them? Makes them ridiculously, fantastically wealthy. They're the success story of the early 16th century. Knocked out the Venetians. Um, eventually, that colony in Brazil. Eventually, and actually, let, let me talk about what happens. Because the, the interesting thing is, Spanish are a bigger country, of course. And they kind of get jealous at what the Portuguese are doing here and, and the wealth that they're bringing, first from Africa, right? They, they do make those trade connections in Africa, then India, then Indonesia, then China. All these goods are coming in. Um, they're becoming ridiculously wealthy. 
and the um, I we know we haven't gotten to Columbus, but let me just mention this: is is a few years after Columbus gets to the New World, the um, they call in the Pope, who is was Rodrigo Borgia, incidentally he's Spanish, um, to divide up the world between the Spanish and Portuguese spheres in uh, the city of Tordesillas. This is 1494. And the Pope says, okay, everything east of a line, I think it's certain 150 cubit uh, leagues east of Cape Verde or something strange like that. Um, everything east belongs to Portugal. Everything west belongs to Spain. Um, and the reason I mention this now is Brazil falls on the Portuguese side. That's why they can take that. So incidentally does Newfoundland, which is why the Portuguese actually had ships out into Newfoundland uh, fishing in the, the cod shoals there to pick up cod, obviously, and, and hopefully to settle us because they have a good claim to Newfoundland. But it, we'll see. Well, <laughs> I'm not, I don't want to jump the gun, but if we draw a line all the way around the earth, which eventually happens with this uh, Treaty of Tordesillas, the Philippines fall on the Spanish side, which is why they belong to Spain. Um, I'll come to that. Okay, so before Tordesillas, um, the, the 1490s, um, Portugal seems to be the really, really big winner. No other country is in on international trade at this point. Um, and Spain isn't. And the reason, reason Spain isn't is partly because they are still busy trying to conquer the last Muslim foothold in Spain, which is the Kingdom of Granada. Look at your map of Spain. Granada's far south um, eastern corner. They do that in 1492. They also decide they're going to make their country only Christian. So they kick out not just the Muslims, but all the Jews also. Uh, a lot of Muslims actually stay, oddly enough. The Jews are kicked out. They convert or are kicked out. We'll, we'll come to that entirely different talk. Um, enormous topic. But it's the reason Spain really doesn't get into this until 1492. <laughs> you know, signal moment in our, in our course so, so far. So let's get to Columbus. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about who Columbus was. Was he funded by Jews? Was he really not Italian because he never wrote anything in Italian? Was he, um, I don't know, a Knight Templar? I mean, it's complete nonsense. Now, Columbus was Genoese, which means he is like a Venetian merchant. He's just focused on the other side of the Mediterranean. And in his early career, he actually went to Chios to pick up mastic. You know, mastic, it's, it's the gum of a tree that you chew. So it's like chewing gum. It's um, mastiga, masticate, the word to chew, it comes from mastiga. So um, so he was just an ordinary merchant um, early in his career from Genoa, who decided to think big as the Portuguese are getting in on this act. And <clears throat> he decided he wanted to know more about navigation. He went to Portugal. Makes perfect sense. That's where he learned um, Celestial navigation. It's also weirdly where he learned to write. So he, that's why he doesn't write in Italian. Genoese isn't a written language anyway. But even when he writes in Spanish, he writes with Portuguese spelling sometimes because that's where he learned um, everything. And he um, had this idea that um, while he's in Portugal, that maybe it doesn't make sense to go all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way down to the tip of Africa, all the way, all the way, all the way up again to India, and then get to Asia. Maybe you could just go around the western way and get around the earth ease more easily. Now let me let me briefly dispel a misconception you may have, or most people have, is that people thought, oh, the world is flat, you can't get around the world, you'll fall off the edge. No one ever thought the world was flat. That's nonsense. Um, and if they did, they were not, that's not mainstream thought. Um, everyone knew the world was round since Ptolemy, ancient, you know, geographer. Um, in fact, they pretty they got pretty close even at, at measuring the Earth's circumference, believe it or not. Um, what they didn't understand is how far around it was. Um, I think Columbus kind of had this misconception that what we know as the whole new world was missing. So if you can collapse by about 5,000 miles, that's about the size of the, the Earth that he thought. And he had a lot of silly ideas too. You know, he read John Mandeville, he read Marco Polo and thought he could get to China. And, uh, you know, 
<laughs> to his first voyage, the people who um, he brought with him were um, uh, scholars in Arabic, thinking that they could communicate with the, the great Khan of China, which was just made no sense. So he's, he's definitely misinformed. But one thing he was not misinformed about is the roundness of the earth. Everyone knew that. What they didn't know was that you could get all the way. They thought you're going to run out of food <laughs> before you ever, because there's no stopping off points. You go from, you know, from Spain somewhere or, or the Canary Islands all the way around and you're trying to get to somewhere like Chipangu, which is Japan, or, or uh, Cathay, which is China. There's no way you have enough food uh, to make the whole thing. That was their real fear. And, um, you know, and the other thing is the Portuguese said, we have a way to get there. We have all these stopping off points. Why would we take a chance in going across the ocean? There's only one ocean, right? <laughs> and... When we, when we know we can stop off all the way down the coast of Africa, in India, in Malacca, in Macau, okay? Why would we do that? It doesn't make any sense. It's a long voyage, but it's so profitable that we're not sending someone off the edge of, of the, <laughs> no, no, no edge of the earth. You know, I think this whole story about the flatness of the world, that was made up by uh, Washington Irving. You know, the guy who wrote Sleepy Hollow. I think he wrote, he, and he, was, he should know, have known better. He knew about Spain. He was actually, Think ambassador or something at some point but in any case he um wrote a set of stories and made up this idea that all the advisors said the world is flat you can't go over it the story is much more interesting than what he said first of all columbus said okay if portugal's not going to support me who is spain is not because they are engaged in the reconquest of of uh of the kingdom of granada Let's go to another nation state, a place that has money and, uh, you know, kingdom. We can't go to Italy because Italy, these little nation states, you all know, um, they don't have a ton of money. They're, they're small and weak compared to the nation states. So who would make a good choice? England. Great choice. King Henry VII. Um, uh, Money-grubbing <laughs> kind of king <clears throat> who did a lot to stop, you know, the wars in his country end of the Wars of the Roses and made his country financially solvent. But uh, Henry VII, he was a good investor. And Columbus, I think his brother, I think he sent, Columbus sent his brother to the court of England and asked, um, would you like to invest in a journey around the earth west in a westerly route to get to China uh, and compete with the Portuguese, of course. And Henry VII says, great idea, but we've already got someone. Sorry, we have this great Venetian guy. His name is Giovanni Cabotto, John Cabot. And we're gonna, and you, you know, you're, you're stupid because if you look at the shape of the earth, if you go around the equator, it's really, really far. If you go around the top of the earth, it's not that far at all. Um, planes fly that way, right? If you take a plane from California to Europe, you go over the, Whole, basically because it's much shorter that way and he said if we take a ship we're gonna go by the Northwest Passage to China because everyone knows if you go up north of England and then around the, the northern part of the earth it's gonna be a short passage and we'll get to somewhere I think he was thinking you know Kamchatka you know and then go south there and get to China it makes perfect sense it's not a bad idea and um, Kabato did actually make voyages. This was not not just you know wind. This was um, they're after, slightly after Columbus, and he gets to um, Newfoundland, picks up Eskimos, <laughs> brings back a kayak to the court of um, Henry the Seventh in the 1470s. Think about this, and um, King says this is wonderful. We're going to find gold. This is going to be great. Sends him back on a second voyage much bigger, um, and they never return. So, so that's, that's why the English are in on the game very early and out of the game um, within a few years, really. And his successor, Henry VIII, has no interest in it. He wants to conquer France and be a, play with the big boys. You'll remember that story, right? So um, Columbus tries France, another big nation state. That would make a whole lot of sense. And France says, yeah, this is great, but we have our own plans. Um, France was busy building itself up as a nation. Remember, they're suffering after um, 
getting kicked out of Italy. They're, they're more interested in Italy. I think that's that's by and large what it is. Remember those big Habsburg-Valois wars where they're engaged there. Um, and France is kind of um, waiting to invest. And part of what happens, I think, in the long term is the wars of religion uh, co completely dislocate them for a while. But they do, do eventually actually send um, Jacques Cartier in the, to, to uh, what's now Canada. Um, they eventually send Verrazzano, if you're ever in New York, there's the Verrazzano Narrows Bridge that goes from New Jersey, it goes from Staten Island to Brooklyn, I think. <clears throat> um, he explored those places. He got to the coast of Carolina and s s went to the Outer Banks and said, oh, this is interesting. There's the, there's the ocean. We just need to go on the other side of and get to China and was looking at the coast of like North Carolina and thinking that was China. So, so they were there. They were definitely there. Um, the French also tried to do a colony of Protestants uh, under La Donniere in um, South Carolina and the Spanish wiped them out. So that's later. Okay, it's later 16th century. I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. But, but I want you to realize the French were, were in on this. They just didn't succeed in the, in the early part of the, certainly not in the 15th century. There may have been fishermen out on the northern banks, uh, you know, Bretons or um, someone. So, so they may have had knowledge. So the, might the English have had. So, but the point is where Columbus eventually ends up is, of course, Spain. And the Spanish, once they have uh, kicked the Muslims out and gotten rid of the Jews, and uh, and I should say not even Spain. This is Castile. This is Queen Isabella herself. It's not Aragon, really. Says, okay, we'll we'll invest in this. You need to find money on your own too. They go to um, what's the guy's name? Luis San Angel. He's a converso, actually. That's the idea behind the Jewish connection, I think. But he um, gets the money. And it is a very small kind of operation. Okay, this is um, three small ships. The names that they've come down to be known today, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria are, um, are I think, I'm not sure they're, they're, they're official names. They were known as other names, so it doesn't matter. But they're small ships, um, 100 tons, some even less. So again, think of the... The n number of barrels that could fill a ship, 100 barrels. It's, they're small ships. They brought, you know, livestock, chickens and pigs with them. They, they brought food, expecting they'd need to feed themselves around the earth. Um, and, um, you know, they were, uh, I shouldn't say not well prepared, but they're much smaller ships than you think. And Columbus did have a, a lot of really, you know, good navigational skills. It's just that he lied to his crew the whole way, told them we're much further than we think. And, and he kept his own private log where his measurements are pretty accurate and good. Now, the, let me measure the, the, mention the way that they measure distance. So remember, you pick a latitude. You go to the front of the ship. You tie a, a log onto a rope. This is the ship's log. It's where the word comes from, log, star date. <laughs> it's a piece of wood. You throw it into the water at the front, and you have knots tied around the rope. And the thing, the ship is moving, and the log goes to the back of the boat, and then you pull it in. And then you count the number of knots. Knots is a, you know, measure of nautical distance. It's a measure of speed, right? How fast are you going? If you, the faster you go, the more knots are going to happen, and the slower the... I, I can't, I don't know exactly how this works, but you understand, it's very, very crude measurement. He does have an astrolabe, he looks at the stars, but he, he rec does what's called dead reckoning, much better than he does um, the celestial navigation. But he's got, he learned all this stuff in Portugal, so he knows this, how to do this. Um, and he's got, uh, the ships are caravels. They're not exactly the same as now, but they're a little bigger, but they're the same basic thing. Big round tub, deep keel, a lot of space underneath. Uh, some have two masts, some have three. They'll have square rigging, square sails, a triangular sail up front. So they, they're pretty navigable. And you don't need a lot of people to move them. Uh, you know, 20 men per, per ship, you know, to work. They're, they're not going to explore. They're not going to settle. <laughs> they're not good. They're going to China to pick up spices and, as merchants, okay? That's the point I want to make very, very strongly. And he thinks if they strike a line, a, a good latitude, 
Well, they'll just go around the earth and they pretty know where much know where China is. They've never been there, right? This is all they know from stories like Marco Polo. China's been closed for a long time, for centuries. Um, but they know the latitude. And they make a good decision. And I have to say, the, the Canary Islands are I was there last year and went to a place that's supposed to be Columbus's house. It's not really, it's it's a little museum, but it's but it's the same period. It's 15th century Spanish town in uh, La Palma and Columbus did have property there he married someone there <laughs> Diego I think was born there maybe even but the, the Canaries what was most fascinating to me is it's a model of um, colonial enterprise that's so different from the Portuguese instead of setting up little factory and trading Spanish put people in and they just dump them there and settle and some will end up farming, some will try mining for gold, some will end up, you know, in, in um, growing things like sugar, right? Um, but, and and the, you know, the reason I mentioned the Canaries is that uh, they grow wine there too, incidentally, great wine, but, it's, uh, but sugar is what they try out there. And that's the model for, of course, the other side. And so why I mentioned the Canaries also if you draw that line direct, and I did this, I went across the Atlantic <laughs> in a ship. It took a week. Um, it took him a month on a sailing ship. But the whole point was, I was to relive this whole thing. Is he went from the Canaries all the way around to the Bahamas, landing on people think Watling's Island or one of those islands in in um, uh, the Bahamas. Also, I should mention are not very promising. They're sandy and shallow meaning there's not a lot of soil and there's a lot of seawater and it's not it's just not a great place to farm certainly or found a colony there were people there the arawak uh, carib people i think were there um but columbus looked at the place and said okay let's keep going we're here for gold and for spices and we're not a china yet but we'll get there and when they did meet people i have to say you know to Columbus's credit, because there's not a whole lot of credit that will go to him really in the long run. But Columbus kind of looked at these people and remember he'd never seen an Asian and said, well, they sort of look like pictures I've seen of Asians and what I imagine them to look like. And you have to stop and think for a moment that the people, the Native Americans who settled in this area uh, 10,000 years before, of course, came from Asia. They are they are ultimately Asians, right? In their features, they're more similar to Asians than Africans, which he would have seen, or Europeans, or people from the Middle East. So I think we can give him a little credit in thinking, okay, I'm sort of somewhere near Asia. I've got to be, you know, let's just keep going. And so that's why when they landed, uh, very, very easy passage, by the way, you know, even though <laughs> several... Uh, possible mutinies uh, along the way and you know they thought they were going to run out of food and he was lying to his crew and all sorts of bad things that's that's a, aside from the point you know the, the voyage itself is fascinating but not really uh crucial historically but insofar as they get there and then finally they meet people and they say mm, okay where's the gold and the people keep saying no oh, because some of them actually are wearing little gold nose pieces and earrings and things and they keep saying, oh, just go over there. It's over there. It's in this place called Cuba. <laughs> Cuba is what they're saying. And so, so Columbus kind of goes on a mad hunt. And if you look at the letters that he writes back and forth to Charles V, who's the emperor at this point, remember, remember from our other story, um, Charles V wanted to, uh, you know, um, no, I'm sorry, it's not Charles V. It's, it's, it's still Ferdinand and Isabella. We're, sorry, we're in 1492. I'm thinking of Cortez writes back and forth to, to um, Charles. This is um, Isabella herself. He sends letters back to her, writes an official account of this um, that says, um, I see spice trees. I see beautiful ports. I see all sorts of wonderful opportunities for Spain to build an empire to make money, obviously that's what they're really interested in, and to increase the glory of God. And I think on some weird level, Columbus really took this seriously. His name, Christopherens, means Christ bearer. St. Christopher, remember the story of St. Christopher? Had saw this little boy on the edge of the water and said, 
and the little kid said, hey, mister, can you take me across the water? And he said, oh, yeah, okay, just get on my shoulder. And this giant, Christopher, starts walking across the water and he goes, oh my God, kid, you are heavy. It feels like I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. <laughs> the little boy says, oh yes, you are. It's Jesus. Okay, so poor Christopher, he's not a saint anymore, but he's still, some people still like him as the patron saint of travelers. But in any case, Christopher Columbus thought, I am bearing Christ across the waters. And that's why I'm, that's my name, <laughs> Christo, Christo Ferenc. So, uh, so conversion was part of the plan for the very beginning and setting up colonies very different from Portugal. This was not, the, they were populated places, but not as dense, but he was trying to get to the dense, rich cities of China and get the spices still. Let's keep going, let's keep going. Find the gold, whatever. So he picks up some stuff, some parrots, a few people, brings them back to Spain, goes on another voyage. All sorts of interesting things happen. He sees people smoking. He sees uh, chili peppers. Smoking tobacco, I mean. Uh, he sees uh, maize. He sees all sorts of things that are, you know, of world economic importance. Um, not many spices, incidentally. The only, I mean, chili peppers, of course, are spice, I guess. But um, allspice, which dumbest name for any spice we have. It's a, it's a, he calls it pimienta instead of pimiento, meaning pepper. Looks like pepper. It's a little round spice, but nothing like pepper. He thinks that's going to be of importance. It isn't actually, weirdly enough. Um, you could still buy it, but no one really knows where it comes from, like Jamaica. So um, Columbus turns out to be a terrible governor. He <laughs> mismanaged. His men go off on hunt raiding. They eventually end up fighting with the Native Americans. They find evidence of cannibalism, which they say, oh, this is horrible. Let's just massacre them. That that's what they deserve. I mean, just horrible, horrible things happen. And, you know, it's, it's that, that part of the story is not part of the larger exploration story I'm telling. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that apart. But just so you know, it's, it's a disaster. And Columbus really doesn't have much interest in governing either. Um, he wants to find China and keeps traveling and traveling and exploring and keeping, you know, trying to find the stuff that he came for, which is the spices and gold and uh, whatever. So um, so he goes off on his merry way. Uh, and in fact, I think in the third voyage or so, he bumps into the mainland of uh, what's probably around Venezuela today. So when you wonder who gets credit for this discovering the new world. He didn't discover anything. Obviously, there were people there. Um, for the first European uh, landing on the continent, it is actually Columbus. Pretty, most people are pretty pretty certain of that. Um, 1501, maybe, right, right around there. Um, that's, you know, eight, nine years after the initial trip. So it's, and he made many voyages. I should mention that also. In the meantime, he was relieved of many of his posts of, as governor of these islands he discovered. Um, Isabel was the, was the main one on the Dominican, Dominican Republic, um, Haiti today, that big island of uh, Hispaniola. Then Isabel in the very northern part was uh, made a colony disastrous. The bad water, bad, uh, you know, fighting with the Native Americans, um, mutinies, awful, awful story. Um, and he kept traveling, and in the meantime, other people were appointed as governors. Someone else actually got the appointment as Admiral of the Ocean Sea also. This was another Italian navigator who they chose, the Spanish chose, basically because he was, uh, I don't know, young, good-looking, a good talker, and convinced them that he could navigate better than Columbus, when in fact he couldn't, and um, was basically a charlatan, more, more or less got the title of admiral and got the money and the ships to go on further voyages of uh, this time actually for exploration you know they were they were looking for more wealthy places to, to exploit basically um, the guy's name you know um, his last name is Vespucci um, think of those be beautiful strawberry blonde the strawberry blonde girl painted by Botticelli um, she's a Vespucci a relative of his um, and uh, 
his first name, Amerigo, of course, right? Now, why is the whole half the world named after this charlatan? America is named after him. It has to do with a obscure map maker in Lorraine, <laughs> in the east part of France, who, uh, Martin Waldseemuller, or maybe he's Alsace, somewhere in there, who's making a map of the world. And he says, oh, all these continents have such cool names. There's America, Africa, Europa. Let's give this other thing America. Let's name it after our Admiral Amerigo's Vespucci, and he put it on the map, America. If you go to the Library of Congress, the map is there on display, and you can see in words, Google it right now, look at the map. It just says America right on the map. He named all this Martin Volsey Muller. Now why? Why is a more interesting question. Um, Amerigo landed about 1404, somewhere around there. Maybe I'm getting these dates wrong, somewhere around there. Um, on the New new World, and he saw people, he met Native Americans there who didn't seem to have any property, didn't seem to have, pri uh, you know, private houses, or they lived communally, they didn't, there was gold lying around, they didn't care about it, um, and they seemed to be happy and in a state of innocence. Uh, this whole idea of the noble savage, although it's not unknown in the Middle Ages. It really gets its main expression right here in his finding these people who were not Christian and yet were good and happy. And it kind of blew Europe's mind open. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there are these people who we've been calling damned <laughs> for all of this time, and yet they seem to be doing things better than we are because they're not so selfish and they don't fight wars and they, you know, all take care of each other's children and <laughs> to do wonderful things and don't worry about property. So the reason this story, um, Amerigo Vespucci wrote it down in a letter, sent it to his friend Piero Sardarini back in Florence. You all remember who he was, right? The Gonfalonieri of the Republic of Florence at this point. And uh, Sardarini um, I don't remember how it happened, but it, it got published, okay? So everyone in Europe is reading about these noble savages and how good they are. And in fact, it, it struck um, Thomas More really strongly. And he, the utopia is actually based on that story. You know, what would happen if you lived in a place that was where the people were good and um, virtuous and noble and kind and didn't fight wars? And so... It has a huge impact on the intellectual map of Europe. Um, the encounter really happens. I mean, it happens before, obviously, but the intellectually, the encounter happens here, right? With that letter to, to um, about the letters about the New World, they get published in, um, in English, even I think. So, um, what happens? Where are we? So that's why the world gets named after Amerigo. Um, the Spanish keep going. Um, eventually, when we get to the 1520s, Hernán Cortés lands in um, what's now Veracruz on the coast of Mexico, and the emperor, Mohecatezuma, Montezuma as we call him, um, in the Aztec Empire, knows they're there. <laughs> he has, you know, runners to, to understand this. And uh, Cortés moves inland with a few horses, a couple of cannons and guns, not a whole lot of men, I think it was like a hundred men, something very small, um, compared to 25 million people living in the Valley of Mexico. I mean, the Aztec Empire is enormous. It looks actually like the Empire of Charles V at the time, interestingly. And, um, and again, I'm not gonna tell this story in detail, I can get to it later if you like, but essentially they go into, wander into Mexico City and the emperor says, hi, nice to meet you. What are a few people going to do? Um, and uh, the Hernan Cortez grabs him, <laughs> seizes him. I mean, literally holds him hostage, which the emperor didn't expect what was going to happen. And the people around him, around the emperor, just don't know what to do. They're like, okay, we're lost. And they... Um, think that the emperor has lost face. They look to a story that, and this is told by um, um, 
Diaz, who was there watching all this, but it's through Spanish eyes, right, his account, um, who says that the Mexicans were expecting a Quetzalcoatl to return and for the world to go into another cyclical calendar. And Quetzalcoatl is a big red beard, and so did, so did um, Cortez. <laughs> so so that maybe they thought this was a fulfillment of prophecy. I don't know. We know no one knows what, what, what really happened. But the point is that they, um, they basically just kill Montezuma and the whole place falls apart. Now, how a few hundred men, or hundred men, whatever it was, um, could take over a huge empire of several million was because they brought with them smallpox and measles, and they and everyone died basically. Within, um, well, I mean, the, the accounts are very widely, but John Stannard thought that if it was 25 million in 1520 something, 1521, by the end of the century, it was down to 1 million Native Americans. So this was absolute decimation of the whole population, and the Spanish just moved in. I mean, they just sent, sent people there. Um, if you're in Mexico City, it's uh, go right right to the cathedral. I mean, it was the cathedral's built right on top of Tenochtitlan, but right to the adjacent to it is the remains of the imperial city um, excavated in a museum that opened um, fairly recently. So I just saw it recently, um, which is incredible. <laughs> it's just just unbelievable large city, and we we tend to think that you know the. Europeans looked down on the Native Americans or something like that. They were in awe of the size of this city, the canals and the ramparts. The city was built inside of a lake. Um, and the markets and the zoo and the botanical gardens and all this stuff that would just, just overwhelm them. And that's, so, so this is the turning point. This is when the Spanish really get the money, um, the silver that's there, the, some gold, um, and, uh, is siphoned back into Europe. It's spent immediately on those wars that we talked about, the, the Habsburg Valois Wars. A lot of it goes into the coffers of the papacy to gild the ceilings, to do you know everything. And um, and I should say the other, you know, the, the other side of this story is that um, is that Francisco Pizarro follows in Cortez's footsteps in Peru in exactly the same fashion. Does the exact same thing seizes the emperor um, in the middle of, middle of political turmoil, Atahualpa, and um, they're in the war, Huascar and Atahualpa, and then um, he seizes the opportunity to just grab the emperor and, and they kill him, you know, basically uh, hold him hostage, get lots of gold. I mean, it's, it's basically the same story repeated for the Kingdom of Peru. The whole coastline of um, Inca Empire of uh, South America. So, um, where do we go from here? So, <clears throat> so the world is divided. The east side to Portugal, the west side to Spain, and Spain fills up the Caribbean. They start, they f finally get a cache of silver in uh, Potosí, which is in South America, um, and start sending it, buckets of it, buckets of it, to back to Europe. Um, and I think where I'm going to pick up this story later is when the rest of Europe gets in on the action, the English, the French, the Dutch especially, and when a whole series of wars begins to prey on the Spanish shipping that goes back and forth through the, from the Caribbean to Spain, um, and when they start muscling in on the slave trade in Africa, Oh, I, this is part of the story. I need to tell now, of course. So the Caribbean, the, the local population, the Arawak, die there. They just bring the African slaves exactly as they had to Canaries and start sugar plantations. The Portuguese do the exact same thing in Brazil, incidentally. Changes the whole face of the human populations moving. Um, and, and it changes the whole disease pool also. Remember, Europe and, and Africa are in one gene disease pool. The Americas are in another, and um, places that are in immediate contact are decimated. The Caribbean, uh, Mexico. Um, so, anyway, we'll pick up the story where the other European powers come to play, come, come into the game, and they knock the Portuguese out. <laughs> Not entirely, but by and large, and they play a very, very different game. It's all about trade then. 
um, and they also settle North America, which is which is another big part of the story, and steal a little bit of the Caribbean and muscle into Asia, and um, and it's a. I'll, I'll continue the story. It's really quite fascinating. So, I have no idea how long this went, but we will um, we'll pick up later, and I think for next time, let's. Uh, I don't know what order we're going to do anything, but I know we haven't done Machiavelli yet, but we will talk about him. He's the exact same time as all this is happening. Okay.